Hi guys, welcome back to another stream of It's a Dharmar. Tonight I have my friend, an amazing artist, also known as Bjorn Hori. He does amazing concept art and he is my inspiration for a very long time. What he doesn't know is that he is one of the first artists that I met in this industry on IFCC in 2016. Welcome Bjorn. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure being on your fantastic podcast. Man. Oh, thank you so much. I'm blushing here. I'm, <laughs> I'm blushing. I'm so happy to finally have you on the stream. You're a huge mm. inspiration for me and for many people. Uh, when I met you in 2016, I already knew your work. And what is fascinating for me is what, how big range of the styles you have. Mm. That's what fascinates me. And I was like, this man is insane. When I met you also, what fascinated me was how humble you are and nice. And yeah, it was really good fun to meet you at the IFCC. Um, I think we we had some some communication before. Uh, we, but yeah, yeah, not a lot. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super impressed by your work, man. You, you worked on so many projects. You have so many styles. I want to know everything. Like, how did it start? <laughs> how did it start? Did you paint when you were younger? Where did you go? And so on. Let's start from the early childhood. Did you paint when you were a kid? Um, well, the thing is, like, my grandmother, uh, she was a painter. Um, but she was not a professional painter. She was just more like a hobbyist. So I always loved to spend my summers at my grandma's and I looked at her paintings. So in that sense, I always got inspired by it. Uh, but growing up, I always tried to paint uh, or draw and so on, but I never became anything. I went to uh, high school with extra art classes. That's about <laughs> my art education. Nice, nice. But uh, yeah, that's, that says how much the talent and hard work pays off. You don't need to study if you're working really hard and from your work you can see that you worked really 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 hard yeah well i i had actually quite a late start in in terms of uh, when i actually started getting hired or and even started learning for real um, i think i was 24 when i switched to um, i what when i finished high school i was working at a like in the normal manual labor mm. uh, uh, as a water filter uh, warehouse worker and construction and then uh, at 24 uh, i kind of was fed up with it and quit and applied to university and i got in and that was the first time in my life where i could uh, spend my adult life on art mm. and completely absorb myself in it and then that made me uh, had gave me the opportunity to really dive and, and, and not sleep, <laughs> try to catch up to everyone else because, you know, everyone fed up doing manual labor for six years or something. I see, I see. But if uh, you, you applied to the university and if I remember correctly, you studied uh, 3D. Yeah, that's correct. I um, The university I went to in Sweden has a, at a university called uh, Kravde which is a uh, city in, in Sweden. Mm. I see. Um, I see. And, and uh, in that university, um, it was uh, computer design, uh, as in um, game design, as in how you play a game. Uh, so and, you know, go okay. ahead. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. I thought you stopped. Uh, so you studied the game design and then you moved to concept art, which is quite interesting you know because no so in, in the university there was game design there was programming um, so I learned C++ and Dolphin oh you were a programmer and then you moved to concept art <laughs> and then uh, we didn't have concept art at all at the university we had uh, uh, 3d animation so it was Maya and ZBrush mm, mm, and see. rigging and uh, things like that 
I see, I see. Well, that's that's very interesting because uh, switching from that kind of uh, you're going from a programming to concept art is always a strange choice for me because <laughs> you know they 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 are, they are the we sit next to each other programmers and designers but they are completely different fields, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Through my career, I have worked with programmers and they are different kind of beast for sure. Mm. Uh, I I, le- I taught myself uh, Q Basic in the in the 90s with my brother um, so i was already familiar with very basic form of programming before the university but it was mostly a kind of a a necessary evil to to pass <laughs> the university to to go through programming classes yeah uh, yeah I, c- I can imagine programming is a beast for itself we have one artist here that uh, he uh, in serbia he taught almost all artists in 3D here and then all of a sudden he decided to move to programming so guys it can happen the guys go from uh, art to 3D to programming it go they go everywhere you know yeah absolutely <laughs> and uh, what i want to know is how did you learn so many styles man like you 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 can do cartoony stuff you can do hyper you can do realistic stuff you can do anything that you want how did you learn so many styles well the thing is is i i was I was teaching character design at CGMA um, many years ago. I had a uh, class there running for four years. And um, in that class, I broke broke down the process of design, like the principles of design, uh, in uh, bite-sized chunks so that you can understand them before you move on to the next step and the next step. And when you, when you can understand design in that pragmatic way, you can actually just swap styles, styles because it's not you're not changing your ability to to design. You're just changing how you mechanically make the drawing. You know, so if you want to do stylized, you have to um, obey certain rule sets that makes it stylized. But you're still designing something on 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 basic design principles that will never change. It's just that, for example, if it's more realistic, you gotta up the detail and up the complexity but you still need a clear readable design you know yeah so so by so by understanding what steps you need to take to design something uh, you can for me there's no problem in changing the the style you just need to figure out how do you get to the end goal in terms of style in, in steps line art fill fill color uh, shading or or photo bashing or you know, it's it's all the same really. So that's the thing we are always speaking here. Fundamentals are the most important thing. And somehow I have a feeling that uh, today, when everything's getting really, really fast, and industry is super fast, teaching is super fast, everything, people are starting to forget about fundamentals. And somehow they're trying to avoid them. And now when you say that you need fundamentals for everything, I appreciate that a lot because the new generations need to understand that fundamentals is the building block for art. And this yeah, absolutely, I agree. It's um, the thing is they 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 learn it um, unconsciously by observing someone that's skilled doing their work, and and we all know the the fifteen thousand thousands mech. Uh, design that's on 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 all these kind of art portals that they all look the same. You can't tell one apart. Yeah. It's because they're 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 just absorbing what someone with more skills have set as a guideline, and they are all kind of mimicking. And so we, they do learn it, but they can't apply it again. That's the that's the problem. A lot of people are facing, and I agree with you that there isn't enough fundamental training in what we do because there isn't really yeah you know, we, we we ourselves set the standard and there's not enough people i think who are who enjoy the pragmatic aspect of <laughs> deciphering design <laughs> yeah i absolutely agree it's it's a painful thing to learn fundamentals because they are boring let's face it they are very boring i mean uh, draw the line uh, do the perspective do this do that and it's much cooler to draw something that you like, but that fundamental is what makes the art good. And as you said, you can thanks to it, you can go through different styles without losing the quality. Mm. 
Yeah, it's like a, a friend of mine who, who was practicing karate, mm. and uh, he he was he was approached by the coach, but hey, now you can graduate, you you learned it, and he said, no, I don't want to yet because I feel my punches aren't of high quality enough. So he himself held himself back uh, one year to to practice to perfection the, the punching kicks, and then he said, okay, now I feel I can go on. To the next step to learn. Mm, smart man. That, that's that's hardcore, and I it, and it and it stuck to me for like twenty years. It's like, oh yeah, that's I always remember him. Oh yeah, the karate guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, but that is that is very powerful because uh, I did the same thing when it comes to art. I had a huge problem uh, with lines. I had a huge problem with lines, and for one year I said to myself, "You're not gonna design anything. You're gonna work on your line quality," and that's. I learned mm. for it on, for one year. I was restricting myself of putting color or anything. So that is a really great point that you gave, and I appreciate it a lot because it's a very important lesson. You need to restrict yourself to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. Do you it's wanna hard. maybe start drawing for us uh, so they can see your amazing skill? I can turn on the sky, the Skype. Yeah, sure. I I literally just started blobbing some shapes down great minds think alike <laughs> exactly uh what, what i want to talk with you about is uh how did your how did your career develop so did you start working first in some studio and then you moved to freelance or did you do your first gig as a freelancer how did that go i want to know a little bit about that well it was an interesting um it's a it's a different journey than a lot of artists do today due to the fact that uh, I started out being interested in games and doing art for games in 2000 forward. Long and time ago, long time ago. Exactly, it's a very long time ago. And at that time, the only like real big news you could get was you went and bought a magazine mm. uh, before really internet became established with, with the websites. So it was like a gaming magazine and you could read about uh, the latest games and news and so on. And I always loved that. And, and in Sweden, you had to go to the import uh, import shelf, like the exotic magazines to, to, to find the video game magazines. And then, then the whole mod scene uh, started an indie game so I, like when I was uh, working in manual labor, I was always interested in it. And I, I found these websites with forums and concept art people. And, and uh, I always kind of tried to be a part of the mod scene and do indie games or mods for, for official games, you know, just to, to learn. Uh, but that the rate of a drawing was one drawing a week, maybe, well, well, if I had energy coming home from work, Mm. Uh, and I the, like the the learning curve was standing still more or less. There was nothing happening in terms of effort because I couldn't spend more time on my art. So, and so when I when I quit my job and went to university, like I said, I could finally uh, dedicate myself with art and time and, and learning. And within a year, I started getting uh, freelance work. Uh, one of the first freelance works I got was with NCSoft for a little dungeon crawler called uh, Dungeon Runner. Okay. And that game was... Um, uh, or uh, The outsource manager was uh, jo John Jones. He's, uh, he's quite known in the outsourcing concept art field. And uh, we... we we really kicked it off, and we have had contact since then. But this dungeon runner uh, was with um, Joe Mad. Mm -hmm. He did all the boss designs and major things, and I was responsible for the armor sets for that game. Nice. And actually, me and my wife did them together, and we ran we ran the halls of that game to find um, <laughs> each other's armor sets. Really, I didn't know that uh, your wife, if I remember correctly, she does clothing now, fashion design, right? And I remember yeah, she's a fashion designer. I saw amazing posts where PDD is, and his kids are wearing the clothes. <laughs> That's congrats on that. It's a huge achievement. He, yeah, he, yeah, 
huge. She's really, really good. I'm so proud of her effort. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, that's that's a huge achievement. So you designed together those armors. Yeah, exactly. So we 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 did that, and um, I did freelance, and then um, Sega or Creative Assembly, more precisely, um, approached me for freelance for uh, their game uh, Viking Battle for Asgard. Mm -hmm. um, while I was still was in university. But uh, I, I designed a bunch of characters for them. I think it was 20 characters or something. And uh, and they wanted me to move there. But I said, no, I'm, I want to finish university before I do anything. So I, I kept freelancing for other clients and Sega at the same time. And uh, more or less day one of me graduating, uh, I moved to England to start working in-house for Sega. Nice. nice. So it was, uh, I, I had an opportunity to learn freelance, but also while in university, there were local game studios. Uh, and I worked there too. And, uh, I just tried to absorb myself completely in the, in the, in art, because I, I moved away from my family, from everyone, and I was alone in, in this city. So mm -hmm. I just thought, well, yeah, a person definitely needs to sacrifice part of him so he can achieve his dreams because the other way it doesn't work. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, that that was very brave from you to do because being alone in a city, it, it is it is hard. It is hard. Even if you know the city, it is hard. So congrats, yeah. on, congrats on that. And what, what I'm seeing, you are painting so easily and talking. And I know you have a stream, so... Uh, can you share your, uh, what is your stream so people can watch it? A lot of the people in the chat is probably from the stream, but I, I do um, I do a daily warm up. It's called uh, on Twitch. Yes. Um, and uh, what the idea, basic idea of it is that with practice becomes you become perfect, right? And uh, I, I, it's a studio wide thing I've introduced to the studio I work for now, where everyone, the first thing they do is they sit down and sketch um, so that they can kind of lose the fear of, of creating something incorrect. Mm. Uh, and if you do that every day, you're going to end up with no, no fear of creating because when you're, you create a routine of just sketching what's in your head, without fear of failing, you'll, you'll just start um, see art in a completely different way. So what I would start to do at these warm-ups is to ask people a random topic. Uh, and uh, I start a clock, which is a 30-minute clock. Then I draw whatever they asked me to draw as being randomly picked uh, without looking at reference <laughs> in public. Yeah. Uh, so it's a really good challenge and a really good practice to just um, like my all my sketchbooks are filled in the exact same way where I don't really care about the perfect quality of a drawing. I, all I care about is idea generating and uh, exercising mental images mm. and sketching is a fantastic way of doing that. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, there is now the thing that everybody is drawing on the computer. And uh, as you said, you have a sketchbook where you don't care about the quality. You just want to pop out the idea and not be afraid of doing it. Doing it. And yeah. I think I think that there is uh, now the, it's a bit of a problem because when you have a piece of paper, you a piece of paper in front of you, you don't have to draw a plus Z. But it opens, opens such a synopsis in your head, as you said, and uh, you start being free, literally free. And the more free you are, the more brave you are. And the more brave you are, the better lines are on the paper. That's my experience. And Absolutely. Yeah, you have to have the confidence. You can see on the sketch that there is a confidence when you are drawing. If it's somebody is doing it a lot, you can see the confidence in the sketch. And I see on every painting of yours that kind of confidence that I think comes from the paper, not from a computer, but from a paper. Am I correct about that or am? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but again, it's, uh, the, it's the whole thing about uh, changing styles that like you mentioned earlier. It's so not, not so much about what you use, it's how you use it. 
So for me, I can paint, I can design the same thing on paper as I, I do on, on digital. It's just different approaches. Uh, but both both aspects you have freedom in when you when you uh, practice the freedom of creating. Mm. And uh, when I mentioned this on 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 my warm up stream uh, a while back, but I I literally remember the day where I where I realized that I I don't I'm not held back by technique anymore. Oh. That te- Technique is not the gap where I can where I can create something that I want to create. Now that all that's left is, um, of course, I, you will always be better technique wise. Technique wise, but now it's more down to what's in your head, what you want to say, what you want to design, rather than how do I construct the light correctly? How? Why is this shape wrong? Um, and it, it, and for me, it, well, that was like a light bulb moment. Where I realized, oh, okay, practice makes perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Thousand hands, a uh, hundred hands a day, makes a difference. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, I completely agree. That yeah, that light bulb moment is, yeah, when it happens, you're like, oh my god, I'm so free now. But you suffer a lot until you come to there, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's not for free at all. <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a big pain. Like it is a big yeah. pain until you come there because so much effort, painting every day, being stressed out. And uh, did it happen to you like it happened to me at one point when you are improving, improving, improving. And at one point you're just, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm not improving. How did you cope with that? Yeah, for me, like I, I come from a martial arts background. So I know I know the feeling of not understanding what you're supposed to do. Like your body doesn't want to respond to what you're what you're being told to do. Sorry right? for and, interrupting. Just which martial arts? Uh, my primary one was jiu-jitsu, uh, the Olympic style jiu-jitsu. Okay. And uh, and I, I'm really familiar with that feeling of you see the teacher what the teacher is doing, and now you need to try to copy it, but your body just can't do it for some reason, you know? And, uh, you, but eventually you, you practice each step of the move until you can do it, and then all of a sudden it just flows out of you without uh, a problem. So, so for me always when I encounter a problem in my art, I go, okay, so what's missing? Why, why can't I force my body to make the correct moves or my mind to make the correct moves? So even though I'm, I'm petrified by the fear that, I, oh, shit, I can't do it, I, the pragmatic aspect of my mind goes, all right, all right, all right. What step here am I, am I too fat to do? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> that is a very cool point. I mean, I also do sports and I really like this kind of uh, theories about sports and art because I think that they all literally overlap but art overlaps with everything so <laughs> so yeah but the sports somehow gives you that kind of discipline and rethinking stuff definitely yeah I think it's a very tangible way of understanding something because you can literally make your body do something and that doesn't require a brain it just requires uh, uh, perseverance yeah mm-hmm keep training and your muscle will be strong enough to do it and you don't need brain power to do it you just need to integrity you know yeah yeah but but you need brain power to 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 practice it to yeah, yeah yeah sure. and what was what was uh, what was the hardest thing for you Bjorn to learn what what was the thing that you struggled with the most were it values were it lines were it is was it design what was hardest thing for you well, for me, it's a little bit hard to say uh, now, 15 years down the line of, of what, uh, what I'm struggling with uh, or, or what I used to struggle with. But clear, obviously all the standard things of, of how does light work, how does color work, um, all these things, right? But... Uh, you always learn them the more you, you focus in on the problem. Mm. Yeah. So I, I, 
for example, anatomy. I'm self-taught in, in when it comes to anatomy, and and um, I see a lot of these artists with a great knowledge in in the anatomy because they've been schooled in it, right? There's some master who's kind of telling them how how it all works and where it all goes and all these things, and uh, I think that's great. But I never experienced that. So what I always did was I I drew something from my imagination to the best of my ability. And when I noticed that like I, I messed up particularly on the shoulder or particularly on the ribs or particularly the proportions of the body, and I realized, okay, that's my my real big weak point here. Like all the other things, oh, okay, maybe they're passable, maybe they're not perfect, but this really stands out being broken. So what I did was I kind of localized the problem and started practicing that thing alone. Let's say, oh, suck at proportions. So I started practicing how does proportions work? Uh, you know, mm. and things like that. So it, it was never really one big obstacle. I broke all of it down into smaller uh, manageable ch chunks. I see. I see. We have one question that I would immediately want to ask you because it overlaps with the thing that we are talking about. Uh, fight milk, high fight milk. Uh, if I'm reading it right, fight milk. <laughs> so the question is for both of us, I apologize. But uh, since Bjorn is a guest, guys, you need to understand if you're asking questions, please, they're for Bjorn, they're not for me. I'm just a host here and uh, the stream is about artists. So the question is, uh, how do you develop idea and when you are research ideation phase, how do you avoid leaning on references too much and resist influence of the work you are seeing to the point where you end up with a Frankenstein mashup of every idea you are looking at? So technically, the question is, how are you doing something? How do you do something unique, Bjorn, and that it doesn't look like the inspiration you took? Right. Well, for me, what one thing that I was teaching at this CGMA class, for example. Is, uh, is that you should first formulate the idea of what you're going to design. Right? Let's say a monster in space. So you, that, that's step one, right? And then you look up really interesting things uh, on the internet or in books of, of things that might inspire you when you're going to be in the creative process. So that being said, like... You shouldn't you shouldn't try to be as literal as possible when you look for reference. So you shouldn't Google space alien or mm. sci-fi monster. You should try to find things that could inspire you to create that. So maybe fish guts, um, snail glue, <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever whatever you can come up with, or or even non uh, concrete things, you know, like an interesting pattern or uh, Whatever it is that can just spark an idea, and and even though let's say you find something that looks really beautiful in terms of reference, you shouldn't copy that reference. You should look at the reference and understand what makes it interesting. Is it the the texture pattern? Is it the way the light hits the surface? Is it the shape? And then you try to formulate that reference into something. When you create, let's say, maybe we look at a car, but I'm going to design a robot. So I yeah. des design the shape of the robot, but I look at that car and go, oh, that I really like how the highlights are hitting certain surfaces. And then when you create your version, you go, okay, so in, in this situation, what I have created in the design, light should hit it here. And oh, yeah, that, that shininess, oh, yeah, I could add it. You know, you don't want to copy the car shape just because it's in the reference. You want to copy the idea. I apologize. Yo, yo, yo. I apologize for that, really. I don't know why why this is happening, but uh, this is the third time this week. Like, they're, they're, they're fucking up something. Okay. Uh, mm. I apologize, really, for this. So, we are back. We should be online. Let me check. Mm. Do so, you see my uh, Photoshop? Yes, yes. I apologize, really, for this. Uh, okay, we are back. So we can continue talking just 
Guys, I apologize, I don't know why, but this happened also last week. They are fixing some cables in around my house for the internet. They are bringing in the faster one and better one. Yes. And uh, I apologize really for the break. And I apologize to Bjorn, like I apologize on the last. And every time this happens, I feel really bad because it looks very, <laughs> nope. unpro looks very unprofessional. But thanks God that the YouTube cuts it out. So we were talking about the unique design and how to get it. Yeah, so what I was saying when I got cut off, I think, uh, was that so when you have a big uh, mood board of references, uh, what I used used to do to practice this was that I, I zoomed in and maybe had five references on the screen out of 50, and I would create a concept based on things that was interesting in that combination that I found appealing. So let's say, oh, that belt... The idea of that belt is cool. I'll design something similar. Or I like the idea of the hair or whatever. And then I would move the screen and have uh, five new references. And I would go, oh, that oh, that could be a cool combination of, of, of flavors. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, that that is that that is a great uh, thing how you explained it because I also do it that way. I just want to mention I'm not gonna talk too much. Uh, I just want to mention that, uh, for example, guys, because the question was for both. Uh, when I worked on the CG Alive project and uh, the aircraft, I posted in the chat. Uh, I used squids and octopuses as inspiration, even though it was a flying vehicle hard surface design. So I was steering away from the classical vehicles just to get something new. And exactly what Bjorn said. So this is, that is a typical example of what he was explaining. So yeah. Uh, Bjorn, how do you work with color? Do you because I seen you are now starting with color? Uh, how do you start with the color? Can you explain us a little bit about your process? Because for me, it's always fascinating seeing a sketch or a black and white piece going to color. Mm. Well, this is a technique I I actually uh, played around with on the stream. It was born on the stream. Oh, uh, really? Slowly but surely, I kind of figured out how to do it in a fun way, uh, how to get color on grayscale, because that is always a um, standard issue with people. And it's a, always a question that's popping up is, how do I color grayscale? Mm -hmm. How do I make it look good? And all these things. So this, this is actually the result of me getting questions like that. Uh, the, the basic idea is just when you use this method, uh, you you can control you can control it back in a way where you, you deal with the basics again, you know, like hot uh, light, cold shadows, and so on. It's like standard uh, color theory. Mm -hmm. uh, so the reason why I'm always uh, separating grayscale from color uh, isn't because I can't do it. It's because it is a um, result of client work. I see. Because, because when, when clients ask for a design, usually colors are a secondary problem that you need to solve. Uh, that's as, as in a problem that follows form. Uh, so I always do the design grayscale first to show the client so they can get an understanding of character, pose, and attitude, and design. And then they go, all right, so what does he look or she look in color? And in that, that turn, then uh, you can start focusing on the next step of the design. Um, but if I do personal art or illustrations, where I don't need to run it past the client in terms of design, that I can just create color, I tend to go color first. So yeah, your basic knowledge is obviously really high because you can do both, like anyway, and that's what I love about your your work. I mean, that is super impressive for me because most of the artists use one technique, and you're using multiple, which makes you master. And that's why <laughs> that's why I invited you to stream, <laughs> <laughs> so I can steal my ideas. So I can steal every idea of yours. And yeah. The bad thing for me is I don't do creatures and I don't do that kind of stuff. So, I, <laughs> <laughs> but 
<laughs> but but yeah, this what I'm seeing on screen is already looking super sh nice, and it has been like you're not drawing even 20 minutes or something like that, and it's already <clears throat> presentable to client. Yeah, it's uh, like I said, it's a technique I started uh, creating on the stream, and uh, I think it was the end of season three. Um, and the season five, we're about to start. So that's the fifth year of doing uh, daily uh, warm ups. Um, and uh, I remember one of the episodes I said, Oh, I want to try to introduce this to client work, this way of sketching. Yeah. Uh, I just want to, I said this, like, I just want to figure out before I introduce it as an option. I want to understand how I do it and uh, like iron out the problems of form and color and presentation and mood and most of all usage. Like when am I supposed to tell the client I can do this style by the way? Yeah. And it ended up being um, a technique I use a lot uh, for um, for a new game that's yet to be announced but I am helping them out with I think 20 characters so far and almost every design starts out in in this particular technique where where I create uh, high high level ideas and present them in a quick fast way where they can go oh we like this we don't like that we we like this idea that you did um, because if, if, if you approach it in this way you know like i'm creating a, cr a a creature now and in you said 20 minutes have passed and i have al already can show the idea to someone more or less uh, then i can switch to the next one and base it on completely different parameters of uh, uh, space creature or alien you know maybe it's made out of slime and all i need to do is just redo the same process in a rapid way and i can get a result that's uh, uh, presentable because like I said you should have the idea before you start painting so I can define the idea beforehand and I build the painting up with that in mind you know so if he was supposed to be slimy I would have started in a different way hmm. because it's, it dictates it in a in a you know a, in a major uh, design principle you know, of slime I see I see there uh, there is a question and i think it's perfect now to ask it uh, fair sancho hi fair sancho he is asking uh, do you ever feel that feel that your designing is bad if so how how do you battle it and how do you make peace with it um i don't make peace with it <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question by the way and i think that's a thing that a lot of people struggle with um personally um, if I make a bad design, I redo it. Yeah. I define, I, I give myself an on the spot review of what I'm doing that caused it. Oh, bad shapes, bad, uh, too busy or, or something like that. And I just can it, throw it away and redo it. And I don't want to send it to someone to look at if it's not good enough. I mean, sure, not every design is a home run, but it needs a certain like checklist, which is, if it passes that checklist, it's okay to send. Like, is it, does it look cool enough as a like first pass? Does it have uh, correct anatomy, correct colors, correct? Uh, does it fit the brief and all these things, you know? And then if, if all those boxes are checked, you can send it and, and, and if you're happy with it, especially you send it. If you're not happy with it, you should never send it. Uh, you should pinpoint what breaks it uh, in your book and then fix it for a restart. Because um, there was a, a old coworker of mine, uh, Christina. She, uh, Christina Lavina. Oh, okay. Uh, she, um, uh, all everyone in the studio gets. Uh, tutored by me mm. until they're self-sufficient so I don't need to hold their hand but I'm always there if they have a question or if they want to bounce an idea or bounce a design of me I'm I'm there uh, instantly and in answering the question but uh, it was around midway in her process of learning to stand 
really well on her own and hold her own ground, she 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 sent me three designs and said, oh, "What do you think of these?" So instead of me telling her what I think is good or bad in her design, I asked her, "Well, what do you think?" <laughs> and she said, "Oh, this is good. Number two is good, but number three I don't like." And then I just asked her, "Why do you send me something you don't like? Then what's wrong with it?" And she said, "What's what's what's wrong with it?" Then I agreed, and I said, "You know, you have the answers there. You don't need to, you know, you don't need to ask me. Yeah. Just do that to yourself next time, and only send me things that, you know, you are proud of and enjoy. And then if 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 they tick the boxes for the studio's quality, it's you know, green light all the way." And uh, that's that's such an important thing uh, to learn is to self curate uh, what you're sending out. You shouldn't send something just because it's six o'clock and you got to send something. Yeah. And then in the end, if the client chooses the shit one, there you are, <laughs> you know, trying to make some shit design work just because you had to send something. Yeah, that, that, that is that is again the steps that we were talking about. Fundamentals. If you're jumping the step, you're not gonna go good. Life is about steps, small steps that incrementally become bigger as you progress in yes. every direction. And yeah, I completely agree. I think that the person has to has to be very judgmental of himself or herself, because uh, when you are doing that kind of designs, you have to judge. You literally have to judge. Like, uh, and it's not easy. It's very very. It's very hard because uh, you're literally killing a baby of yours. And I know mm. that it can be hard, but as you say, you have to judge. You have literally to be, be very judgmental, judgmental of your work. Yeah, it's um, like some in the, some people in the chat, uh, I don't, I can't read the chat at the same time, by the way. It's a bit too much multitasking. Uh, but like first Sancho is one of the guys that are coming to the stream and so on um, and fight milk. But um, one thing that I always try to, to um, push in, in uh, my Discord server is, is the ability to give feedback yeah. in a constructive fashion. Because giving feedback is such a vital role in teaching yourself at the same time as teaching someone else what you think. And, and if you just say, oh, this is shit or this is good, you're not actually formulating any thoughts. You're actually not saying anything. But if you try to specific, specify and say, I really like the use of orange com combined with that green, you're actually having to th make a concrete um, point, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and a lot of people say you shouldn't give feedback to other artists that only in secret, hush, hush, hush in PMs. Mm. And and for me, I, I definitely not come from that. I don't come from that kind of school. I, I rolled my eyes as you, you know, as you said that sentence, when you said it, <laughs> I roll, I literally rolled my eyes. I'm going to put the camera in front of my eyes and I'm going to roll them again. Because, <laughs> because uh, I mean, with the critic, you need, you need critic. I absolutely agree with you. You need a critic to improve. And if you don't want a critic, don't do art. I mean, you can do art, but you'll never be successful at it. Because after all, you're doing art for other people. You're not doing it for yourself. Yeah. And how can you teach yourself what you're doing wrong if you don't even practice telling someone else or uh, even practicing that aspect of your mind of, analyzing art Absolutely. and saying what you like and don't like it's like it's so backwards i think yeah and there is a lot of, and that is an ex excellent point you, you said i mean when i was studying and i was developing a lot of people will come and they would be like i don't like this and that's it pretty much but that's not constructive i mean it's it's on the level of uh breaking up with somebody and telling them the problem is not in you the problem is in me and it doesn't <laughs> it, literally that's how i see it and uh i mean you don't get anything from that but if you come and say as you said i don't like orange or i like orange uh but there is something off with it uh that's a constructive critic but also you have to be very experienced and brave to do it yeah and you you can only be that by practicing it yeah you have to become a master or to feel comfortable in your work that you can tell to yourself that something is bad so you can say it to others yeah but, but yeah that trend that's appearing in last 
two or three years where mm. critic is bad for yeah. me that's a nonsense that's a nonsense and i always say imagine being in a studio and uh, <laughs> our director coming and not not being able to give you critic because you don't want critic i mean you, <laughs> you would be you would be fired very fast yeah or you have to go and, and very carefully have a person personal meeting in a conference room <laughs> And, and gently, carefully say, break the news that maybe, just maybe, you could possibly consider to change the blue, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, how ridiculous that would be. Uh, uh, that's. I hope never, that's never going to happen, but the world has changed. And uh, I can tell a story about that when I was studying. I know that Pasadena also did that. And car design, since car design is super uh, fast and super competitive field, and uh, when we were when we were studying there uh, i remember that also guys from pasadena and ccs told me that and uh, teacher would come and they would do their artwork on the paper we also did that in italy and we would draw something for seven days so you had seven days to draw something and to make it polished on a2 and then a teacher comes on the end of the week takes out a big black marker <laughs> and what he doesn't like he sketches over your sketch mm. And his sketch is literally like, and you are watching seven days of your precious baby being like scribbled like this is a, this is horrible. I don't like this. And it, <laughs> and and in Italy the the professors use a little bit stronger language. So you're looking at that, and but but it's a great exercise because you learn that the sketch is there to be thrown and to be changed mm. and need to be messed up and to be scratched and you can get emotionally attached to it because the moment you get emotionally attached to it it's not gonna be good yeah and also it teaches you that maybe you don't know everything yeah absolutely absolutely i mean it's it frees you also as we talk about the sketches it frees you you will start understanding that it's just piece of paper and you will be making many pieces of paper in your career mm. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. Uh, Andrea Chiampo, Antonio Esparza, if I'm pronouncing good, I hope, uh, and Sergey Punchev are saying hello. Hi, guys. Thank you for joining oh. the stream. And if you didn't hit the subscri subscribe button, please do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm becoming a real YouTuber. So yeah, yeah, you YouTube salesman, through yeah. and through. So, guys, hit the subscribe button, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, we started talking about yeah about that kind of what i want to touch with you is we spoke about the critic i want to talk with you about the the conferences and i saw your work for the thu golden ticket uh, mm. it's, it's looking really good man i hope that you will win it again because you won it last year <laughs> and, yeah i'm I, i'm I'm, um, I'm holding the golden belt the championship belt at the moment yeah well deserved well deserved <laughs> and I, I i i i i want you to come to thu this year also so you win the ticket and come and uh, if andre is watch if andre is watching this i hope we will bring you again <laughs> yeah cough cough <laughs> let's give it to me <laughs> I, I, I we said that by accident <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But uh, you were on IFCC this year, and I know that, and I know that you give a lot of lectures around the world, and you have been everywhere almost. And how do you like doing that kind of stuff, and uh, what motivates you to do that kind of stuff? Well, the thing is, like when I was younger uh, in um, high school and before that, I always wanted to be an art teacher. Uh, I kind of like the idea of of being a guy that just kind of hangs out and creates things with other people that fascinated me because at that time that was the only scope there was uh, realistically in my world art art teacher were the only like ability to use art so that was the goal i wanted to be then i understood that you could be a professional illustrator uh, at seventh grade i think hmm. and i thought wow that's that's pretty cool so I always enjoyed the aspect of in, in inviting anyone in. And uh, I think because of my way of thinking, I can also explain it in a kind of good way. Um, so it naturally just ended up with me uh, teaching other artists. And one of my 
requirements at the studio I work for now was to be in charge of internal education for all artists. Um, and when I joined the studio, um, I had to you know, establish that. And it ended up with me uh, figuring out how to tell someone. And in the, that same time, I also did that CGMA class. So things kind of started sinking. Mm. And, uh, I was also asked later on by, by IFCC and industry workshops and so on if I was interested in it. And I said, absolutely, I, I'd love to. Uh, one of the reasons why I can only go to workshops um, as an instructor, as, as a way of um, work of mm. sorts, is that uh, I'm a family man. And, yeah. uh, I, for me, I, I can't justify to just kind of pack my bags and say goodbye. <laughs> yeah, it would be very awkward. Like, yeah, so at least I, I bring home some some money and experience and marketing and so on. It, it's for the future, you know. Plus, I can help people uh, and uh, network and hang around artists, which is absolutely crazy. Yeah. Uh, do Do you think that that kind of events are very beneficial for people that uh, do art? Um. I think absolutely Abs that that would be a like a firm yes, mm. but um, I think a, a beautiful thing with different workshops like IFCC and you mentioned THU, yeah, uh, they're completely different experiences, and I think is because they're organized by other people and it creates this um, kind of a cherry picking of what you want to to learn or what you want to improve on. I think it's a beautiful thing like IFCC is is this creative hangout where where everyone is just relaxed and, and hangs out with each other and have beers and eat good food and talk art where THU is this big show uh, in comparison, you know. And uh, I think it, the beauty of it is you can get totally polar opposite experiences but both positive by going and, and i think that's the that's the really strength of how the industry is now in terms of workshops uh, it's, it's so it's important to have human contact especially as an artist yeah we do tend to work at our homes mostly and hide in our caves <laughs> yeah so it's good to get out and to speak with the similar minded people. Yeah, absolutely. And see what other how other people think and how behave and you get kind of normalized in a way. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're being insulated from human contact more or less, and then you're dropped into a bucket of five hundred other people all burning with the same desire for art and, and it's an eye opener. And burning from desire to talk with others. But we forgot yeah. to, we forgot how to talk because we didn't talk for 320 days, at least in my yeah. case. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, the beauty of it is that we have all a common denominator. We yeah. have, all have art as a passion that we can all, if all else fail, you can say, do you want to see my portfolio? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's an icebreaker, you know. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah because... As you said, every event has a different energy and uh, different people, different country. And But what I like the most is exactly that energy that you feel when you come there and there is similar minded people like you. And mm. uh, that it's a literally like a wave of energy that splashes you and you become even more creative. And for me, that's amazing, for example. Yeah, I think, I think it's a, a real great thing that industry created. I remember my first workshop in 2004 in Amsterdam. A long, long time ago. That was uh, six mo uh, Marko Djurjevic did that workshop, if I remember it, correctly. Bla it Massive, was... Massive um, Black, Massive Black, right? It was, yeah, Massive Black's uh, conceptart.org's first uh, European workshop. And it was with uh, Jason Ma um, Manley, Andrew Andrew Jones and Marco Djurjevic. Uh, I think that was it. There, everybody when they are speaking about that, they are saying like it was something super magical, you know, because it was one of the first ones that ever happened. Yeah, 
And it was only 30 people who went to the workshop. And uh, it was just kind of hanging out in, in Amsterdam. Drinking beers and enjoying. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that workshop is when they had prostitutes as models. <laughs> nice. Where was I then? Oh, yeah, I was 14 yeah. years back then. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, oh, they were obviously scared. Uh, but it, it was just a room of artists. You know? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, artists ex explore a lot of stuff. Not that I, <laughs> not that I know. Not that I know. <laughs> uh, guys, we have uh, around 10 more minutes. If you have any questions, please do ask because we are going to finish in around 10 minutes. And uh, it would be nice to ask some more questions to master like this that Bjorn is. Uh, Bjorn, what kind of advice would you give to young artists? To how, how would you tell them to enter the industry? What to do? Any advice? Right. So this is is a thing I talk about um, now and then. And it, and it is in a way which I think is unfair of a lot of other professionals in saying how they should do it is because usually they, uh, they started 10 years ago and the industry looks absolutely different today than 10 years ago. And, and you, I wouldn't really know the perfect way to get hired today. But I can, I can say what, what I look for in hiring a person and, and my kind of roundabout ways of getting there. And, and the biggest uh, um, suggestion would be figure out what you want to be in the industry. What, what is the thing that speaks to you the most? And, and you should be honest with yourself in terms of strengths. Uh, if you are really weak in something, yes, you can manhandle your way to a career in it. But most likely you will be unhappy with it because it's not something that sits inside of you that you love doing. Uh, for example, I love characters and creatures. I can do environments all day, but it won't make me happy. I yeah. love sitting down and making a monster. And... That's step one, figure out what make, what makes you tick and then figure out wh where in the uh, hierarchy you will sit in as an illustrator or the original creator because an illustrator doesn't necessarily need to design anything. An illustrator just needs to present a picture really, really well. They could be handed a design and go, here, please pay, pose this in fantastic light and that's where you are happy so or you are the person creating the design and someone else illustrates it uh, you have to kind of try to place yourself somewhere and then when you understand i love doing monsters in pre-production then you at least know what your strengths need to be as you're trying to learn so, so maybe technical skills isn't high, the highest up on the list. It's maybe it's the ability to come up with an idea or visualize a problem or solve a problem visually. And, uh, and those are the things that you can actually practice as long as you understand what, where you are or where you need to go. But if you, if you don't know and you just go, oh, I'm going to be a generalist, a generalist that does what? Oh, a little bit of everything. And, you know. <laughs> Jack of all trades that that you can have a career in but you're not going to be happy and you're probably going to change at some point rather fast yeah that is a great input i really like it and now i have an idea that we we, we should talk about because uh i had a serious problem when i was entering industry and that was that i couldn't find what am i supposed to do mm. because i was doing 3d i was doing design i was doing 2d i could do an, any of those and I didn't know what I was. And what I want to talk with you about is uh, what, what kind of things do we have in the industry? Because uh, I will tell you that I didn't know that design is separate from illustration or it's separate from uh, other stuff. And I didn't know that there are initial sketches. I mean, I knew it from car design, but it was a, it was a mess for me, honestly. And I get messages. I'm sure that you also get them from time to time. What am I? Literally question, what am I doing? You know, because people don't know 
what so let's make a conversation about that what do we have we have guys that design that's the thing that you like to do that i like to do that's initial blockage stage we have guys that refine the design those are the guys that also design we have 3d modelers right mm -hmm. we have uh, uh, creature character uh, hard surface design uh, in hard surface weapons uh, vehicles that's what i do and uh, props and other stuff mm -hmm. uh, we have 3d artists we are not gonna separate all that the 3d artists do but 3d artists are the guys that take our designs and uh, uh, make it uh, optimized for a game or a, for a commercial or a movie right yeah yeah absolutely we have illustrators would you like to clarify what they do <laughs> well it depends i mean the the pure, uh, it's, pure a mess, idea. Man. it's a mess it's a mess when you start no it, it it is because they're 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 bridging yeah I mean, everything is bridging now since 2016. On, on paper an illustrator is illustrating uh a, a task yeah. a set design and some illustrators design at the same time, but then there are two things. They are a designer and an illustrator. Yeah. Like what I'm doing now, uh, professionally, this would be pre pre visualization concept, yeah. but it's in an approach of an illustration, which sells design mood and, and, and feeling and texture and placement, but that's just to sell the concept. I'm still just designing here. I'm not, I'm bridging it to illustration as well, but fundamentally it is concept design, yeah. creature design, but it is an approach of, of, of illustration. So you can be both, but in the purest essence, an illustrator is just illustrating something. Mm -hmm. I, I, this was a very bad idea from my side to start separating it live in the video because it's not possible <laughs> and my brain is now spinning. But I think, guys, that I will make a separate video and I will investigate everything and put it on the paper so I can explain to people. Because I, I was in a mess, I'm telling you. I was in a mess. I didn't know what I was till 2017 or something like that. Mm -hmm. People were calling me 3D artist. And I was like, guys, I design everything in 3D. And they were like, yeah. you're not a designer, you do it in 3D. And I was like, I am a designer and I do it in 3D. <laughs> so it was a mess for me, figuring out, mm. you know. But, but you're, a, the, I, I, I would place you as a designer. Oh, thank you very much. That's how I that, feel in my heart. That uses 3D. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I don't optimize. I know how to do it. I know how to, I can mm. bridge to optimize and prepare it uh, game ready and uh, VFX yeah, but, ready. But I don't want to do that. That's not yeah. my thing. No, because you're a designer, yeah, not a not a production artist. Yeah, the uh, creative process uh, m makes me tick, and that's it, pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. So, but it, mm? yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry for that. interrupting. Sorry, I'm the host. I shouldn't be interrupting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Please go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask you. Let's do a, one more question, and we wrap it up with this because we touched many amazing subjects. I really enjoyed this talk, and I knew I'm gonna enjoy it. So how do you practice the ability? Ludwig is asking, asking uh, how do you practice the ability to see pictures in your mind? Do you visualize a subject in a pose or a certain light situation or how do you start? Um, it is, a, you can practice this. We can, we can do a little, I have done this on a lecture. It's a little fun uh, mind game, right? Uh, let me try to, re to remember it. Okay. Okay, so in, in, you close your eyes <laughs> and uh, imagine... I, do it? I will do it. Okay, I'm closing my okay. eyes. So close your eyes and imagine a robot. There is a hot girl in front of my... No, sorry, robot, okay. Uh -huh. And you will, you will probably see it in a specific way. This is your standard default robot mind. But this robot, you now we say it's an assassin robot. And now that robot robot morphs into something else, right? Maybe the pose changes, maybe he gets a sword in his hand or laser beam or whatever it is. You already moved cogs around in your brain and assembled a new type of robot, right? Mm. But let's take it to one more step. This robot uses smoke to assassinate. Mm -hmm. And now you get a little bit thrown, right? Because the combination of a robot assassin that uses smoke 
is maybe something you haven't really given a lot of thought before, but you will get there in the end. You, you will come up with a c conclusion somewhere inside where you go, oh, yeah, that is a robot assassin that uses smoke. Mm -hmm. And that's a really easy way to kind of visualize a problem. So whenever you get a task of saying you need to draw a hero that shoots fire from his butthole, <laughs> you know, you go, oh, what that, would that look like? And you put those things together. And then you go, no, that's stupid. And then you go, okay, how can I make it work? What if I add stone? into the mix and then you, you, your mental image starts to morph and, and, and change to, to a new solution. Right. What, and what a great, what a great man, what a great exercise. So that's a really good way to uh, practice seeing a mental image. And then uh, the more you do it, the more you practice putting it on paper and being able to de define what you're seeing. I understand now why they took you to educate everybody in the studio, because this was amazing. <laughs> this was amazing. And let's do one more question. I wanted to wrap with this. Uh, oh. So what kind of portfolio should a creature designer have? Um, and should um, I learn a 3D program like ZBrush? I will tell you about that. Nina, hi, Nina. You should learn a ZBrush if you can, because it's a big plus and the other stuff. Amazing Bjorn will answer. Absolutely. That is a great way to do it. But I, for example, have zero ZBrush in my yeah. monster yeah. concept uh, category. But w you also need to figure out where you are in the pipeline as a monster designer. Are you the original creator or are you the one uh, making it better? Mm. And if you like to come up with new cool stuff that no one's seen before, then you're a first in the line of uh, character design pipeline wise, you are the previous or the concept artist, the main concept artist that defines what everything should look like. Yeah. Or if you just love getting uh, someone's mad explorations and go, okay, how do I make this into something more concrete? Or, or you know, you get you, you're the second in line. And maybe you love doing that as well, because there are some insane artists who do that. Uh, and maybe they're bad at coming up with an idea but they're, they will slay it in terms of second pass. Uh, that would be the you know step one where you need to figure out. But so if you want to see pre, a pre, a pre, um, previous concept artist or a first in line concept artist, a lot of different ideas, a lot of different design solutions to the same monster to show um, range. And then the final uh, result where you took it in the end so we can see in a way your own art direction or if, if it's for a client to just in, include the path at least in one part in your portfolio where you can go here's my first ideas this is where i took it and this is uh, this is the final version so you can someone want to hire you go oh first three ideas are shit they're all the same or well one i really like one but the art, art director picked three ah okay i see and and if you don't show that ability to adapt and, and morph depending on request, uh, you're not really a good uh, like first pass concept artist. Yeah, I see. I see. So like, again, if we come back to where are you? What do you want to do? And what do you love doing? And then just try to find the use of your love the best way in a chain of command or a, in a big machine like a studio. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good advice. So the point is finding yourself, guys, and finding what you love and not losing and then yourself. master. Yeah, <laughs> spend many hours not sleeping and working on it, and it yes. will pay off after fifteen years. Or sleeping is important, though. So make sure you sleep, sleep and eat and meet people. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> don't. That. I slept last time, two thousand fifteen or something like that. But yeah, I heard about sleep. It was something in the youth. <laughs> you lay in the bed or something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was born and I remember a cradle and then <laughs> Yeah, and then and then I forgot about everything. <laughs> yeah, I just been standing. So yeah guys, this was episode 19. Bjorn Hori, amazing Bjorn Hori, my friend and amazing designer. I'm so happy that they brought you here because you're such a bad badass artist and you describe stuff so good. Oh thank you. It was my absolute pleasure and joy to be here. I hope that
that I will see you on some event this year. Absolutely, teach you. <laughs> teach you, Andre. <laughs> I will send you personal message, Andre. <laughs> also present. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I hope that you will win a golden ticket and I hope that I will see you on some event, uh, some other, if not on THU. This year we have some plans, but we can't speak about that. So in private as usual. So guys, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for asking questions. Hit the subscribe button and stay in touch because we'll be bringing more amazing artists. Have a beautiful evening, everybody, or a day. I don't know what time is at your place. And thank you for coming, Bjorn, one more time. Well, thank you. See you guys. Bye. Bye.